So causal cognition is how people learn and reason about the causal structure of the world, but also how they use this causal knowledge to shape their reasoning and decision making more broadly. And um, I believe, and many of us believe, that people, it's an integral part of cognition is the fact that we build causal mental models to make sense of the world, and that allows us to predict, to control, to some extent, to explain, and also to attribute responsibility or blame, and, and many other facets of cognition. And um, it kind of ranges, I, I think it ranges from low level to high level cognition. So um, even perception where you think that you're just taking in the world is actually shaped by our causal assumptions. So we can sometimes even change the order of things or the time delays or spatial relations based on the causal assumptions we have. And so I would argue that causal cognition is at the heart of cognition itself. And, or, often crucial in, in things like law, medicine, business, politics, and everyday reasoning, even when you're just trying to figure out why your friend is late or why your computer doesn't work. So the, one thing is I think that we are amazing at drawing causal conclusions or even coming up with explanations, even based on very minimal data. So we're very quick, I think, to see causal links. And sometimes that, that's a great facility, but it also can potentially lead us astray. I mean, just one, which is an old example, but it's a classic, is, is the um, example where people were really worried about the MMR uh, vaccine causing autism. And it was a very natural kind of inference to make because around the time that people were given, that people's children were given the vaccine, was also around the time when typically autistic traits are potentially shown. So there was a very natural kind of like um, progression from the child had a vaccine and then a few months or a few weeks later, they seemed to be you know, displaying you know, certain symptoms. And so even though there was no, or there is no causal link, it's a very natural for us to um, project a link. And we, we often learn about causality through not just correlation, but also temporal, um, temporal contiguity, spatial contiguity, and all these cues are very important cues to um, actually learn about causality, but they can, again, they can lead us astray. And so not just um, the MMR vaccine, but actually, you know, even nowadays in COVID times, there's been a lot of spurious inferences made based on what seems like a con contiguity in time or some kind of correlation. And as we know, one should be very careful of inferring causality from correlation. And um, often, we, I don't think that we, we just randomly just infer, we, we're actually very targeted, but if we're very targeted and we think, does this cause that, we will look for things that then happen after we've done something and we are very quick to assign causality. And I've actually done quite a lot of experiments showing that people do this. If, you, if, a, if a press a lever <laughs> and then something happens, we're very quick to think the lever caused the thing. And, and maybe less capable of realizing that there might be some other common causes which, which led to the correlation. So there, we use a variety of methods. So, so I'm kind of interested in low level, even perceptual things where we show people falls colliding or whatever, and we get their judgments. So that's quite nice, more or almost psychophysical. And we also look at kind of more abstract tasks, reasoning tasks where people try and learn about variables. But also in the legal context, we might, if we're looking at legal reasoning, we might show people um, videoed legal cases or simulated legal cases or transcripts. And also more, more recently, we've been looking at um, larger data sets, natural data sets like Twitter and doing some kind of, if you like data mining analysis of Twitter and, and, and other social media things. But, but just to give you a flavor of, of, I think one of the more abstract um, approaches, I'm going to show you how we, how, how we look, explore people's ability to um, factor in feedback loops. The kind of studies we're interested in is if you have a system of a few variables and you don't know how they interact and you're able to watch them in their natural kind of progression, but also you have a chance to intervene and change the level of one variable to see how another variable changes or not. 
and, and see whether people can you know, pick the right types of interventions, whether they can learn from their interventions. And what I'm going to show you in a minute is um, how you might learn even if there are feedback loops. In this particular setup, um, I, I'm just going to go with the abstract version, which is um, where you have um, a system with, and you have a blue variable, a red variable, and a green variable. So this could be like blue might be um, uh, the level of crime in, in a certain district, and red might be how much the police intervene, and green might be the happiness of, of uh, how happy people are about police, the police in that, that area. Okay, and so so what participants would do, and I'm going to show you a little video here, is they'd be shown the levels for the three variables as they evolve over time, and then they will also be given the chance to intervene and um, you know, move one variable up or down. And, and then while they're doing that, they can kind of register their, um, their beliefs in the causal relationship. So in a way, two things. One, is there a relationship from blue to red or green to blue? And also the strength, we also allow them to kind of register the strength as well. So I'm just gonna show a little demo of, of someone doing this. So we've got three variables. At the moment, you can see how they're evolving over time and nothing much is happening. And then you intervene to, bring blue down and then you'll notice straight away that green is going up so there's a kind of you think there's an inverse relationship there so you might mark that and then you might go back and play around with red move red up blue goes down so that you also think there's an inverse relationship there you, you can mark that mark that up and then um you, this is done in kind of real time so it's quite kind of naturalistic and then you you, you come to green and you might, you know, try, you know, fiddle around with green and doesn't seem to be doing so much. We've got a kind of a track of the, um, the interventions across time. And, and, and obviously this is a very simple model, but you can imagine how we have more complicated models. And we also use feedback loops as well to kind of um, really see how well people can kind of do in these kind of situations. So, I mean, obviously, um, some of what we do, we're very capable of coming up with explanations for patterns of data. Even if we only see a few examples of something, we come up with a, a nice story to link it together. And, and that's what we do. And I think that's great. We do that. And I think uh, AI is still struggling to be able to do that in the flexible way that we do it. But I think that we have to also realize that it's not just about coming up with explanations. It's also, it's also about evaluating the quality of these explanations. And I think that's what people struggle with. And partly because it's hard, it's hard to evaluate because if you think about it, if you come up with a certain explanation, you know, like why your friend is late for dinner or why, you know, why you've got poor marks on an essay, there's quite a few different explanations and you need to, in a way, think way up. You need to think of how likely is the evidence given multiple different possible explanations of that of that. Plus, you need to, in, in a sense, uh, you need to think about the reliability of the information you have as well. And, and, it, and it becomes a, a complicated problem. So I would say, in terms of advice, I suppose, often, it's good to entertain more than just one model of how things could be. So I think that's a very basic bit of advice, which we often neglect is, don't just think of a model that you think is most likely you also think, well, is this evidence you know, possible under different possibilities. And I think that's already gets you into another kind of, into a better realm whereby you're not just assuming one model is true and then trying to fit everything into one model. So, so crime, I mean, in everyday life, hopefully we don't um, encounter too much crime, but when we do, you know, we're, like when, when something goes missing or when, you know, I mean, actually online, online stuff is a really good example, um, actually, Perfect example, um, I'm expecting a delivery of some books, okay. And yesterday I got a text saying, your delivery, we couldn't make your delivery, please um, follow, go to this website. And I, immediately, and I was really excited, I was thinking, oh great, you know, the books are coming and it's annoying, I missed it. So I went onto the website and then just as I was about to get, put in some details, I thought, well, hang on a second, how do they know that my books were coming? You know, I didn't, and this seems, and then, so as soon as I then, saw the alternative that this might be some kind of scam and then immediately my perspective changed and I started I actually went along a bit just to see when they would ask me for something really important I kind of made up my name and my date of birth and that was quite good fun but it was when they started asking me for bank details I knew it was definitely a scam but it was one of those things where 
it was a switch in a way, it was a switch from just ticking along, thinking, oh yes, this is great, my books are coming, let's get the delivery done. And then just switching to thinking, hang on a second. And actually I did kind of then try and test out my alternative hypothesis that it was a scam and it was a scam. <laughs> so hopefully, I mean, luckily I didn't give any, any important details. Well, if for those people who are, I mean, interested in machine learning, big data, all those kinds of approaches, there's been a really a push to explainable AI, which I think is a you know a great thing, obviously, and a really important. And I've started to go to conferences and I've read stuff on explainable AI. And one thing that kind of um I think is really important is that understanding explanation, it's not just um from an AI perspective, we need to understand it from a human perspective. And actually, it's quite complicated what people like as explanations. And so I think that causality is key here, that people tend to like causal explanations, but it's not clear how you should give them an explanation and also how they fit an explanation into what they already know. So I think that we really should do more research on causal cognition here and what people actually value as a good explanation and what they can use. And it's not completely clear. And, and philosophers have, have argued that, you know, an explanation, an explanation should be simple and it should cover the data. And that's not always what people value, actually. People don't want too simple an explanation. They also don't want too complicated an explanation they can't use or understand. They, they like to understand a mechanism in a way. They like to understand how you get from A to B. And so I think that we can learn through looking a bit more carefully at causal cognition. We can really improve our understanding of what would make a good explanation. And I think this is key in explainable AIs. And, and I think that maybe not enough work has been done in the cognitive side of explainable AI. And I think that's a really amazing area to, to look at. 